Well, welcome to today's gathering of the Global Church. My name is Dan Allen, and I serve as the Associate Director of Spirituality and Service at the Notre Dame Alumni Association. We are excited and humbled by the amount of interest in this program, as we have over 1,700 participants registered, representing 38 countries from around the world. Today, we will continue our discussion on the church in Islam. If you missed last week's meeting, please know that the recording and the recaps are on Think ND. We at the Alumni Association are grateful for our primary partner at World Religions World Church in the Notre Dame Department of Theology. This program is also co-sponsored together with the Tantur Ecumenical Institute, the McGrath Institute for Church Life, and the Jerusalem Global Gateway. We are so grateful to each individual on the team who has worked to launch this series. We've designed these events to have as much interaction and engagement as possible, and we'll be giving you the opportunity to ask questions of our faculty and also to participate in community circles for discussion after the presentation. We encourage you to ask questions during today's program and to use the Google form that we are sharing with you now please submit your questions there. This will allow us to facilitate the questions as effectively as possible. We will try to, to answer as many of them as we can, given the time we have together today. As is our tradition, we will have a 15 minute breakout session so that we can continue to meet each other and to discuss today's topic in small groups. We will hold these community circles or breakouts at the end of the formal portion of the program. I will facilitate one of these groups and our presenters, Gabriel and John, will do so as well. Should you not wish to break out, you may choose to leave the meeting at that time. We will not be reconvening after the community circles and our program will conclude at the end of those meetings. As the Associate Director of Spirituality and Service at the, at, here at the Alumni Association, I oversee the work of Faith ND and I appreciate the chance to collaborate with my colleagues at the Alumni Association who administer Think ND. I would particularly like to welcome and thank those who learned about today's opportunity through our daily gospel reflection email. It is certainly part of the calling of our Christian and Catholic tradition to engage those of other faiths. So this series is a wonderful opportunity towards that end. And now it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome our speakers for today. Gabriel Saeed Reynolds, the Jerome J. Crowley and Rosaline G. Crowley Professor of Theology, and graduate student John Shinkwin, who will moderate today's discussion. John? Thank you so much, Dan. I'm very happy to be with all of you today. And following our discussion last week on the Bible, the Quran, and the religious life of Muslims, we turn today to the topic of the church and Islam through the centuries. The Holy Father, Pope Francis, has made relations between Catholics and Muslims a very special concern of his pontificate. And on their hand, senior Muslim clerics, such as the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar in Cairo, uh, Ahmed al-Tayyib, have met with Pope Francis and extended the hand of friendship to Christians across the world. In today's gathering, we seek to understand how these two great communities of religious believers have related to one another through history, where we are in our relationships now, and what signs there are as we look ahead to the future. Since these questions affect conversations between believers and not only academics, it is fitting that we can ask them of someone who as well as being a renowned scholar of the Quran and Muslim Christian relations, is also deeply involved in the church's work of strengthening ties of affection and fraternity with Muslim believers. It's the first job, I think, of any moderator, any moderator, I should say, to make the speaker blush. So I'm going to try. Uh, Professor Reynolds has been writing, publishing and teaching on Muslim Christian relations, at least since the time of his first book on the subject in 2004. And today he serves as a consultor for the Catholic Church's Commission for Religious Relations with Muslims, which is a part of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. Uh, Gabriel, now that I've done my best to embarrass you, 
Uh, I would like to start by asking you about the earliest period of Muslim-Christian relations. So my first question then is, what do we see in the Quran and the earliest sources of the Islamic tradition? So how did Muhammad, how did the Quranic community relate to Christians? Thank you, John. Um, I'm really happy to be back. Glad to connect with you and to connect with all of the, um, the attendees and the Notre Dame community. Uh, and this is a difficult one to start with. Um, and an, an important one, the, the question of the relationship between um, Muhammad in the earliest Islamic community to the church informs how Muslims and Christians um, relate with one another today. I mean, just to keep in mind this sort of, to give a little background to the question before uh, doing my best to come up with an answer. Um, for Muslims, the example of Muhammad is, um, uh, is foundational for the way that they envision their own practice their own um, their own belief and their own conduct um, they look to him as uh, not only the final prophet but an exemplar um, and so um, it's encouraging then to look at a number of bright spots in the biography of the prophet muhammad now sometimes we hear in the west right sort of caricatures uh, that um, well islam began in sort of this uh, wave of conquest and violence and aggression um, and we should, um, you know, read the, the Islamic sources with sobriety and, and look at all of the accounts, um, address them in their fullness. Um, but once we do that, we do no uh, notice a number of bright spots, beginning with the Quran itself. So the Quran, which um, just as, as a reminder, is for Muslims, the, the very word of God given to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. Um, great angel, by the way. Um, Good name, anyway. Uh, yes, uh, the Quran um, says, for example, in one of the last chapters, chronologically, according to tradition given to Muhammad, that is chapter or surah five, um, it, it sort of assures Christians, Jews, and another group known as the Sabaeans, that, that they, along with the believers, have nothing to fear. It seems to be a sort of promise that they too are included within divine providence and um, presumably then will have a pathway to heaven. So it, 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 that's not only there, by the way, it's also in Surah 2. So it comes up twice in the Quran. There are other verses as well. I don't want to go on forever and ever. But most famously, maybe verse 82 of that same chapter, chapter 5, speaks of the Christians as those who are closest in friendship to the believers. And there are a couple of anecdotes from the life of the prophet, prophet which sort of illustrate that friendship. Um, one of the most famous ones is about the first part of his career. So just a reminder, I won't go on forever, I promise. But just a reminder, the first part of his career was between 610 and 622 when he was preaching in the city of Mecca, which is today in the western part of Saudi Arabia. And during that time, he was facing the opposition of the pagan community, at least according to tradition, the pagan community of that city. And he sent some of his followers away for safety across the Red Sea where to Ethiopia, which was a Christian country. And as you, as you know well, um, it, it, along with Armenia sort of states the claim to being the first officially Christian country. And there the Christian ruler um, protected the, the first Muslims from the aggressions of the pagans of Mecca. One other, one other anecdote, and then I'll, I'll be, be done with this one. Uh, it, so just one from the second part of Muhammad's career, which is between 622 and 632 in the city of Medina to the north of Mecca, still in what is now Saudi Arabia. There was, according to tradition, a, a delegation of Christians who came from a South Arabian city known as Najran, which we know now from inscriptions and archeological digs and things that it really was a center of Christianity. And um, they came up to meet the prophet. And um, a couple of details of that in, uh, encounter are really informative and illustrative of the relations between Muslims and Christians. One is that Muhammad allowed them to, to pray in his mosque, the Christian community. And they had a dialogue and Muhammad didn't sort of say, okay, your beliefs are just fine. He did challenge them, right? And invite them to convert to Islam. Yes. But yes. when they held fast to their Christian faith, he said, then, you know, go in peace. Um, so it's a real example of dialogue from the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, it's not all sort of roses, um, especially at the very end of the Prophet's career, um, the Islamic conquests begin. And uh, the, those will be especially 
directed towards the north to the southern parts of Palestine and what is now Jordan. And uh, there there'll be violent confrontation with the Christian communities. Thank you for that. Um, before we move on really um, from the earliest period, I just want to ask you about a few of the other verses in the Quran that relate to Christians. Um, I guess I, I, I've forgotten where the, what the reference is, but the, the line that says, uh, they have disbelieved who say that God is, um, is the Messiah, the son of Mary. Uh, how do we hold verses like this in tension with the, with the very warm uh, commendation of um, the believers, the Jews, the Christians, and the, and the Sabians, or, or whoever, you know, whoever, however we understand that verse? How do, how do we read that, perhaps that conversation within the Quran itself right. about how to understand uh, relationships with Christians? Yes, so a difficult but important question. So that line comes up twice in sort of five in verse 17 and then again in verse 72. And again, it states, um, they have disbelieved who say that God is Christ. Um, in Arabic, it's, uh, Yeah, that, um, it, I think there are two strategies um, or explanations for how that those sorts of verses um, appear in the text alongside the other more friendly verses towards Christians. And the first one is that we have, we have variant traditions. Um, why do we have variant traditions? Well, then you, you could have multiple theories for that, but it's possible that at different moments, the prophet had different sorts of relationships with the Christians, and the Quran has captured those, so it's captured the diversity of views. So I think that's one strategy, that it's, at certain points, there were warmer relationships and at certain points an emphasis instead on sort of the theological problem of Christian belief um, in the divinity of Christ. And then the other solution I would say would be um, to think that the Quran is able to point out theological difference, um, but then hold in tension with that the possibility for sort of social coexistence, right? And we actually see this today in certain ways, I would say, when there are people with like very strong religious beliefs who might be exclusivist, who might believe, let's just take a Christian as an example, someone who believes if you don't accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, um, you're, you're going to hell. Yes. But they still like manage to get along with all the people around them in their life. So I think right. that sort of tension can actually take place and is one possible solution. Great. So, so in a sense, you're saying it, it's not actually necessary to share religious beliefs in order to get along we can we can we can be we can have genuinely opposed religious beliefs and still live together in in harmony that the quran is perhaps hinting at that yes only only you said it much more concisely and <laughs> i'm not sure i did <laughs> <laughs> thank you okay well I'll, I'll move on now to the question of the islamic conquests which you mentioned uh what what was the effect of the islamic conquests on the church and how do we see that reflected in Sort of Christian writings of the time. Right. So as I hinted at the end of question number one, um, although there are these bright spots in the relationship between Muhammad and Christians, at the very end of his career, the conquest began. Mm -hmm. So he's no longer just fighting with, um, say, different Arab tribes who are around Mecca and Medina. Um, he sort of begins these um, larger expeditions going to the north initially. Um, but under the, his successors, the first caliphs, as they're known, so Abu Bakr first, then Omar, and Uthman, and others, um, they will continue to spread out these conquests, heading to the northwest, to Egypt and North Africa, um, to the north, to Syria, and then to the northeast, to, um, to what is Iraq today, and Iran, and even further afield. Um, a sort of a good, uh, um, I don't know, memorable date to keep in mind is the Battle of Poitiers or Tours in southern mm -hmm. France, which is in 732, which is exactly 100 years after the death of the prophet. So the, the conquests are like lightning speed yes. and are this, this uh, 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 dramatic um, trend, uh, signal, a dramatic transformation of the religious and political landscape of much of the Mediterranean world. So for Christians, um, these are not uh, generally welcomed. Um, and they are uh, moments of great trauma. Um, it, but it's still a distinction should be made between um, conquest, let's say, of the Mongols. Mm. Um, and I'm sure there are other examples that others would know that are bent on um, the destruction and massacre of the conquered peoples. 
and the simple pillaging of their possessions and the enslavement of, um, of their men and women and children. This is not what unfolds with the Islamic conquest. They are clearly meant to expand the political authority of Islam. They are meant, they're designed for the prophet of the P-R-O-F-I-T, the prophet of the Arabs who are uh, engaging in them. And so there are taxes that are taken from the conquered peoples. Um, but they're not, they're not con uh, conquests of, of massacre and uh, massive pillaging. So um, I think we just need to have a balanced, um, a balanced view of these, these conquests. The earliest Christian sources, you know, they do lament that this religious leader came with a sword as they see it. Our first uh, text is known as Doctrina, Doctrina Jacobi. It's a Greek text from very soon after the prophet's death, maybe in the mid 630s. And um, one of the characters therein, um, we, we read that with a great groan, he said, he is a deceiver. Do prophets come with swords and chariots? So we do have lines like that and, and regret for these conquests. Um, and yet we also find that many of the Christian cities that are conquered, they come to agreements with the Arab conquerors and um, they carry on as far as we can tell their religious lives. This um, is a I point that I, yeah, to... that's very interesting. I particularly want to ask you about this because uh, as I understand it, both from classes that you've taught me and from, from other books on the subject, um, the, the Islamic conquests spread ruled by Muslims, but not necessarily immediately um, uh, the practice of Islam. Uh, and so in the context of, of that, the fact that you have Muslim rule, but not necessarily uh, majority Muslim practice on the ground, for some time afterwards. Can we ask a question where we say, well, actually, in the, in the context of early Islam, does Islam seek to supersede and replace Christianity? Or is there some measure of, is there, is there some measure of, of openness to a, to a continuing validity of, uh, of the Christian faith? So certainly on the ground, I mean, you, you, you've got it right um, there when you when you note that there was not a dramatic wave of conversions to Islam right at the beginning. So the facts on the ground show us that Islam coexisted with massive communities of, of Christians, mm -hmm. um, also of Zoroastrians in Iran, nice. and to a lesser extent of Jews, Samaritans, and other religious communities. So clearly the intent, at least in the first centuries, was not to convert all the conquered peoples. In fact, there's some people who say, you probably know this, that it was in the interest of the Arabs not to convert them because one of the conditions for being a conquered subject to the, the nascent Islamic empire was to pay a higher tax. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, you want a good tax base, you wouldn't want everyone to convert to Islam and avoid, avoid that tax. And, and also theologically, I mean, it's a complicated matter um, we do have traditions or verses in the Quran which speak about making Islam prevail over all religions, um, which are cited today by sort of triumphalist voices within the Islamic community. There's a very famous hadith that's a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, which says he's been commanded to fight until all people witness that there is no God but God and Muhammad is his messenger. Right. So those, those are sometimes cited. Um, but I, I would say that um, there are the other verses in, in the Quran, like the one which promises heaven to Jews and Christians that we alluded to before, that allow for a really complicated picture. And um, just to return to where we began, um, in fact, for the most part, the story of the Islamic, early Islamic empire is one of coexistence and one which in terms of its demography, the peoples who were living together is remarkably diverse. You, you mentioned, and, and I think this might be of particular interest um, to a number of our to a number of our listeners and viewers, the, the the issue of a tax, a special tax that Christians and Jews uh, paid under the early years of Islam and and under under the Caliphate under Muslim rule. Now, this uh, it, this I think is an issue that has been uh, given prominence in both uh, polemical literature against Islam. Some often you know, written in the West, perhaps by Christians, uh, and also um, it's been given a much, you know, much warmer um, hearing in uh, perhaps apologetic writings by by Muslims. So, what can you tell us about um, about the, the kind of the Vimmi status, the the status of um, the special status accorded to peoples of the book 
um, under the uh, under the uh, and I know I'm throwing some terms in there, but which I'll I'll leave you to explain. But but what can, what can you say about the uh, about the special laws and policies that the uh, early Muslim uh, regimes had, or I say that the early Muslim empire perhaps had um, for uh, for Christians and Jews? Well, you've you've cited the right terms, <laughs> and we should really clarify them because there there are those two distinct categories which sort of um, relate to different elements of the Islamic relationship to non-Muslims. Non the first is more theological, according to which Christians and Jews are people of the book. And that's a really a, a key term, right? It, sometimes people some think that, oh, people of the book because they have a Bible. So they mm -hmm. have a book, right? They have a scripture that they read. But when we're attentive to the way it's used in the Quran, this phrase, it seems to mean more people of the book in the sense of a heavenly book. In other words, these are people to whom God has spoken, which means they're part of salvation history, the part of the history of God's self-revelation. And so they have a certain special status the theologically. And I mean, I just, I wouldn't take that for granted. I think that's really important to Muslims. I don't know, one anecdote to sort of inform this is that, um, I don't know, must have been 25 years ago, I was living in Brooklyn, New York, and I was working in a center for Arab immigrants. And there was an interfaith meeting that went on. It wasn't really a religious center. It was just, you know, an NGO. But there was, it was an interfaith meeting that went on. And a Muslim woman in a headscarf, she got up at one point and she said, listen, I want everyone here to know that what matters to me is not whether you're a Muslim. What matters to me is that you believe in one God. If you believe in one God, we're on the same team. <laughs> so there, I mean, it's just one example. But from that perspective, right, people of the book means um, God has spoken to you as well. You too believe in one God. So there's a certain sort of fraternity among us. But then there's the other term, and that's where sort of the rubber meets the road in terms of political social context, which is dhimmi, D-H-I-M-M-I. And it's often rendered protected person. Um, the root of the word is pretty complicated. It can have, there's a debate over whether it has to do with blame possibly or simply with protection. But the, according to the, this notion, uh, this more political legal notion, less theological, uh, non-Muslims in Islamic state are um, restricted in various ways. And there's a famous story that Omar, I mentioned the word Caliph before. So Omar was Caliph number two. When he conquered Syria, he um, established certain conditions by which the Jews and Christians could remain in an Islamic state. Um, and there are all sorts of restrictions and they're sort of jarring to read today. I'm not gonna read them. I don't wanna like um, uh, get too um, problematic here, um, but we could, I could give examples later if it's interesting, right? So they're all restrictions, can't do this, can't do that, can't do that. And um, it's, it sets a clear social situation in which um, Muslims um, who were principally Arabs at this time have a superior status, which reflects the superiority of Islam vis-a-vis -vis other religions. So, I mean, in the 21st century, this is problematic and many Muslims would say, then means there's not the way we're gonna think, of, think socially or culturally anymore. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this, this is, this is something that, that clearly raises a, a lot of interest and is, and is controversial um, even in even in discourse now, um, but as part of our consideration of perhaps some of the more difficult uh, parts of Muslim Christian relations, um, and maybe some of the better ones too, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about some early and perhaps later as well um, Muslim thinkers who wrote about Christianity. And I, I say I ask you this perhaps especially given that your first book. Uh, was on the critique of Christian origins by Amta Jabbar in 2004. What, what can you tell us about him? Uh, what can you tell us about uh, some other Muslim thinkers who wrote about Christianity? Right, yeah, thank you. So, um, uh, Amta Jabbar is part of my life because I spent, you know, a graduate school with this guy. And some people hear Amta Jabbar and they think, I know him, he is the all-time leading scorer in uh, NBA history, Kareem Amta Jabbar. <laughs> played for the Lakers. And, you know, that already makes me a bit um, upset because it's wrong. But then it makes me more upset because I grew up as a, as a Celtics fan, Boston Celtics. I don't know, John, if you, anyway. Okay. I just I just know the soccer team Celtic uh, up, oh, in, yes. up in Scotland. But. In Scotland, <laughs> yes, right. 
Um, it's still a ball, but different. Yeah. Um, so uh, the Abdul Jabbar that I worked on was an Iranian scholar who um, about the year 1000 wrote a book and it was the first attempt to give an Islamic perspective on early Christian history, right? Because Muslims are faced with this dilemma, which is um, we believe that uh, Jesus was a Muslim prophet who basically taught Islam, basically, I mean, obviously some parts weren't there. And then we look at Christianity and we notice how different it is from Islam. So how did we get from A to B, right? So he tries to tell this, this story. I actually um, traveled to Iran uh, soon after finishing my PhD. And um, I went to his, his, uh, his native city or village really. Um, it's called Asadabad, it's in the Northwest part of Iran. And I didn't know what I was gonna do. I just showed up, a friend drove me there and I was like, okay, this is it. We stopped a guy who was riding a bicycle and I was like, um, hey, have you heard of Abdul Jabbar? And he, he said, oh, Abdul Jabbar, the great Muslim figure who died around the year 1000. I was like, yes. He's like, yeah, I've heard of him. Did you know he was from Asadabad? Yes. Um, is, he, is there anything here? He's like, no, no, but he was a great Muslim figure. <laughs> so that was my pilgrimage to Abdul Jabbar. Abdul Jabbar. Yes. Well, he states that Christianity was corrupted by Paul and by Constantine, right. who gradually, out of worldly motives, moved it away from the original teaching of Jesus. Um, so it's it's a very critical perspective on um, Christianity. But as you know, I don't want to keep. I've been speaking long enough about this. But as you know, there are there are figures, uh, other Muslim figures, who engage really creatively with Christianity. I'll just mention one, and then I'll shut up about this. <laughs> Um, some of the, uh, our Notre Dame community may have heard of um, Thomas Merton. Gosh, I think he just celebrated his, the anniversary of his birthday. I'm pretty sure he would have been 104 or something a few days ago, I think. Right. But Thomas Merton was a great Trappist monk, graduate of Columbia University and settled at Gethsemane, the monastery of Gethsemane in Kentucky. And he had a long correspondence with a, a Sufi from South Asia by the name of Abdul Aziz about spirituality. And Abdul Aziz was really fascinated by especially the Trappist monastic tradition of spirituality. So there are lots of stories like that of real deep engagement with Christian thought. That's, I mean, yeah, that, that's a much more positive note. I mean, to, in a sense to take things perhaps further back towards the more challenging side of things, we probably couldn't have this discussion without talking about the Crusades as well. Um, what is the importance, what's the ongoing resonance of the Crusades in Muslim Christian relations. The Crusades is a topic that comes up pretty pretty quickly, isn't it? Yes. When you think of Muslim Christian relations. So you now you say something nice about, well, you know, look at this dialogue in Pope Francis and he hugged, you know, Ahmed the Taib, as you mentioned, is that great? Yes, but what about the Crusades, right? So there is this there is this legacy that has to be dealt with. Uh, around the year 2000, uh, this is becoming like a series of my reminiscence. Uh, 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 and of my own journeys. Um, but around the year 2000, I was in Beirut. I guess, I guess it must have been 1999 because it was the anniversary of the, uh, the conquest of the first crusaders of the city of Jerusalem. Mm. Um, and there was a group in Beirut that had walked from Germany from one of the sites that the first crusaders had left from um, back in 1095, I guess, soon after Urban II gave his famous speech at Clermont. And they were on a sort of a, a tour to Jerusalem, stopping along the way to meet with local religious groups uh, in order to apologize for the Crusades. Mm. So I feel like um, it's Catholics especially, they have this burden of responsibility about the Crusades. Now, others have a different approach, right? Others would say, listen, Jerusalem was a Christian city first. <laughs> And um, the Islamic conquest, um, you know, that, that was the aggression and it continued. And in fact, it was the Byzantine emperor, gosh, was it, uh, I don't know if it was Paleologos or I forget who, the Byzantine emperor who appealed to Urban II to come to help. You know, oh, I couple, don't remember. Yes, I don't, yeah. yeah. A, a couple of decades after the battle of Manzikert, mm. um, when um, uh, the Seljuk Turks, you know, were on this, this, uh, this campaign to the West and conquered most of Asia Minor. So that's, others have that perspective. In, in a way, the Crusades were just reclaiming what was originally Christian. So, um, but the, the, the problem is how to deal with um, this legacy. 
um, without apologetics, but I think with sobriety. I mean, the history of Muslim-Christian relations involved violence, including the Islamic conquest, and it doesn't end with the Crusades, right? Because in 1453, Constantinople is, is conquered by the Ottoman Turks. Right. And that's celebrated, including by the current Turkish regime mm -hmm. as a glorious moment. You know, when the Hagia Sophia was turned back into a mosque quite recently, um, President Erdogan was not apologetic about the, the Ottoman conquest of, of uh, Constantinople, now Istanbul. Uh, he celebrated this as a, a, a brilliant moment in Turkish history. So there's there's lots of complicated topics, um, and when you when you turn to the past of Muslim Christian relations, and I, I suppose if we if we move to a figure who's much less controversial and one uh, associated far more with the building of peace than than warfare, can you tell us about Saint Francis of Assisi? What what's the what's his involvement in in Muslim Christian relations? Yes, so uh, Francis is, that is St. Francis, he's a beloved figure for Pope Francis. Right. Not a coincidence that he's named after him. Um, uh, Pope Francis, of course, is a Jesuit, but um, loves he loves Francis. His most recent encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, begins with a sort of reflection on Francis. I think Laudato Si, which is an encyclical before that, also is named after a line from a poem of St. Francis. So he's sort of been in the current Pope's uh, mind a lot as he um, navigates his way through his, his papacy. The most famous incident that comes up in regard to Islam with St. Francis is his um, journey to Egypt during the Fifth Crusade. Um, and it was 12, in 1219 where he met with the, uh, the Mamluk Sultan, whose name was al Malik al-Kamil. And I speak about this a little bit in one of the videos for this course. And, um, you know, um, that meeting has developed all sorts of myths and legends, which add layer upon layer of that. Sometimes it's really a caricature where they, you know, there's an icon where they embrace each other. Francis probably, St. Francis, was probably not up to that. It wasn't like they were sitting together playing chess or drinking tea together. Probably, probably the incident is real. Right. Already in 1220, Jacques de Vitry, who was a bishop in um, the Crusader Acre, writes about the a visit of Francis one year earlier. So it's not a total myth. He really did go there. And um, he, clearly as a Franciscan, his mission was one of preaching and um, he wasn't carrying arms along with the other crusaders, um, but it probably was evangelism. And I imagine, I don't know how you feel about this, John, but my guess is Malik al Kamil probably gave it right back to him, gave him some good preaching, Islamic style, right back to him. Yes. Um, and then it's punctuated the story famously with the story of the ordeal where Francis, um, I think St. Bonaventure speaks about this. He uh, challenges al Malik al Kamil, uh, or at least his, his religious leaders, to uh, have a trial by fire. And they chicken out, of course, and Francis looks like the cool guy. Um, so, but it is, it is a sign of, of hope, and I think it motivates um, and animates some of uh, Pope Francis's own, own missions uh, in dialogue with Islam. And is, is Francis an isolated figure in that regard, or, or are, there, are there perhaps more recent Christian figures whom you would single out as being perhaps prophets of hope, prophet may be the wrong word, um, but you know, figures, of, figures of hope who augur really quite... Um, positive messages about what could be and, and what can be and what will be, God willing, right. in the future between Muslims and Christians. Yes. You're right to be careful about the word prophet. Yes. Yes. I, <laughs> I spoke with a, a Muslim. A mea culpa. <laughs> no, no. It just reminds me of a conversation I had with a Muslim friend once who said, I was at a religious conference at, in Washington and we were introducing each other. And um, I was like, well, I'm the director of this NGO and I met someone who was a priest and I met someone else who was a minister. And then I met this woman and she, I said, hi, I'm director of this NGO. And she said, oh, uh, my name is, I forget. And she said, and I'm a prophetess. And he was like, wow. whoa. <laughs> so from a Muslim perspective, the last prophet is Muhammad. Yes. But you know, there are so many bright spots. I mean, the story of Muslim Christian relations in the 20th and 21st centuries is overshadowed by this, these sort of, I don't know, um, the moments of great violence. And we think of 9-11 and, and other, other moments of violence or the, the, the American invasion in Iraq. You know, it's not only Islam, um, Islamic attacks or Islamist attacks. 
Um, but there's so many bright spots as well. Um, I love someone named Charles de Foucault, mm -hmm. um, who dies in 1916. Um, he's beatified, so he's blessed Charles, about to be Saint Charles. I think in a couple of months he'll be canonized. He lived a life of prayer among Muslims in the Algerian desert um, and was martyred at the end of his life, not by the people, not by the Muslim community he lived around with whom he developed intimate friendships, but he was just caught up in some of the violence in North Africa at the time. Um, and then Josephine Bachita, St. Josephine Bachita, who was a Sudanese woman who was enslaved, eventually liberated uh, by Italian Catholics, um, but enslaved by Muslims in Sudan. And, um, you know, she didn't live a life of, um, of uh, I don't know, vengeance or even um, animosity towards her former captors, but one of, of complete forgiveness and love towards um, the people of Sudan. And, you know, there are figures today, there are many figures, Muslims and Christians working together. I would just highlight one and watch this. It links to next week's um, live session because there's an organization known as Edyan based in Beirut, but they do work throughout the Islamic world in the Middle East run by um, a Catholic priest named Fadi Do and a, a Muslim scholar um, whose name is Naila Tabara, who's gonna be part of our program next week. And um, they're really working on reforming educational curricula in schools to um, have more positive presentations or representations of the other. So there are all sorts of signs of hope. Right? That's, yeah, that's, that's encouraging to hear, um, particularly in the context of so much that we see on, on the television. But in the really thorny, challenging conversations that need to be had between Christians and Muslims concerning, let's say, for example, um, the situation of Christians in places like Iraq or Egypt or Pakistan, um, what, what can the church do or what does the church do in, in engaging fruitfully and tactfully uh, in these very difficult conversations that sometimes have to be had? Well, it's almost impossible. I mean, the church is almost in an impossible situation, right? Because on the one hand, there's a, a deep desire to advance friendship with Muslims. But then, I mean, the church is has this power. Well, Gabriel, I think you're, you need to unmute again there. How, how about now? Sorry, that's fine, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so on the other hand, the church has this pastoral responsibility to uh, its own flock, right? So how do you negotiate these two things, right? How on yes. the one hand, um, do you have overtures of real friendship towards Muslims? Um, and take the case of Egypt, just make it a little more specific and clear. Right. So Egypt, it's a very complicated situation. Um, Muslims and Christians generally live in friendship. Christians are, I don't know, maybe six, seven, eight percent of the population. Does that sound right? Sounds about right to me, yes. So, but of a, of a massive country, 90 or 100 million people. So, you know, there's a lot, there's a sizable Christian community there. Um, there are all sorts of problems um, that you hear reported. It's difficult to get exact, exact um, uh, figures or accounts of, of um, how widespread they are. But, you know, cases of Christian girls being semi-abducted and sort of compelled to marry their, their abductors and then convert to Islam, maybe. Um, restrictions over re repairing or rebuilding churches. You've probably heard some stories like that, right? So, um, you know, and we've seen two different approaches by, um, by recent pontiffs in Egypt, I think. I don't want to draw a really sharp line between Benedict and Francis, because I basically believe in the narrative of continuity. But Benedict had some sharp words for the treatment of Christians in Egypt. And before him, John Paul II, he um, was a real believer in reciprocity. You know, reciprocity meaning, listen, um, there are enormous freedoms being given to Muslims in uh, Muslim immigrants, uh, along with you know uh, converts to Islam in Europe. Um, I think it was during his pontificate that the uh, the first major mosque was built in Rome, for example. And so um, he said, can't can't you uh, afford at least this um, these same rights? to the Christian, the ancient Christian communities of the Islamic world. Now, um, and then Benedict, you know, had these challenges, especially after moments of violence against Christians. And Francis's approach has been cultivating friendship. I think the goal is the same, that, that is, um, there is the pastoral concern. Um, 
but but I would say I just I'll stop with this. But I I would say generally the church can do better, and we all can do better, right? The church is everyone. It's right. not only <laughs> it's not only the bishops or the yes, pope. not just the pope. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we can all do better to um, uh, be aware of the struggles of Christians, not only in the Islamic world but in other places of persecution. I mean, there are struggles also in India and places like like um, Burma and um, Vietnam and North Korea. So it's not only Islamic world, but there are cases. I mean, Pakistan, there's a case of the, the blasphemy laws. I don't know. Do, have you ever heard the story of, for example, the Bishop John Joseph? Have you heard that story? Uh, I've, I've heard of it, but I, I don't really know much about it. Yeah. yeah I, so I, I know I the story of Asya Bibi, which is more recent, but... Exactly. Yeah, so Asya Bibi, who was finally... Um, cleared of the blasphemy charges against her, which um, had kept her in jail and on death row. Um, she still had to flee for her life. It's not like she could just settle down and continue her life in, in Pakistan. So, and then John Joseph was a bishop who in 1998, um, he shot himself in front of a courthouse to protest the blasphemy laws. So I think those stories are, are not well known. Um, and I do think there's a tendency, I don't know how it works in the UK, but in the US, a tendency to become really wrapped up in our domestic news cycle. Right. But as, as a church, I mean, I don't want to get preachy, but, you know, as a church, um, we have obligations both to country and to the community of believers everywhere. So I think we could do better just being more attentive to those situations where the church is struggling. And I suppose following on from following on from that really in terms of thinking about Western countries and the, the reality, the increasing, the increasing presence of uh, behind a large number of Muslim believers in a number of, of Western countries, perhaps especially Western Europe, but in the USA as well. What would you say about um, the best ways perhaps that Muslims and Christians can work together? And, and one aspect that I want to bring into this also is the, the increasing presence of Eastern Rite Christians also alongside um, their, alongside uh, Muslim immigrants, also many, many Eastern Rite um, Christians who have for many, many years lived alongside Muslims. What lessons can we learn in general? And perhaps what lessons can we learn um, from our, our Eastern Rite brethren uh, about, about good ways to, uh, to live uh, together with Muslims? It's a, it's a great point. I had a student, I taught one of these January courses at Notre Dame. Some in the community here may know that because of the way this, the two semesters have been compressed, we had this two month long break. And so Notre Dame took January and said, okay, we're gonna do three week courses. And I, I taught one there and I had, had a student, um, you, you, know, you know him probably, Abdurrahman Al Ali, who was a student from Jordan. He's an undergrad at Notre Dame. And he was like, you know, it's strange reading some of these texts about conflict and debate between Muslims and Christians, because in Jordan, you know, we just live in friendship with Christians. Right. We're all Jordanians. Uh, Jordan first, <laughs> as, yes. uh, as uh, King Abdullah would put it. Um, so, I mean, there are, there, there are cases where we can, we can really learn from, say, um, Arab or other immigrants who are living in the U.S. and have this legacy of friendship. And, and I would say the story of, um, of the Mus Muslim history in the United States um, is, is one of, uh, with a success story. I mean, it, right. no matter how you, you judge it, I mean, there are six or seven million Muslims, maybe, maybe eight in the United States. And, um, you know, uh, there, it's a story of coexistence and, and friendship between Muslims and non-Muslims. And um, it, it's hard to sort of, I don't know, encapsulate that or just to give an anecdote or two, but that's just a good reminder, you know, every once in a while the story comes up in the news of something that is sort of scandalous or shocking, right? But remind, there are millions of Muslims who, you know, are serving in the armed forces in the medical, in the medical field. Um, so, and I, I would also say that, um, you know, is this a little more complicated? So maybe we'll lose some viewers <laughs> with this. But um, there are a lot of there are a lot of causes which Muslims and Christians, especially Catholics, hold in common. I, I don't really necessarily want to enter onto political things, but you know, Catholics are uniquely positioned to look at things such as Muslim fasting or Muslim virtues such as modesty. So we could look at women wearing the headscarf. Not all Muslim women wear the headscarf, of course, right? Right. There's, there's some freedom there, but still, we could look at Muslims who choose to wear the headscarf. 
and say, okay, that's not part of our tradition, but modesty is part of our tradition. Um, we could look at Muslim um, reverence for marriage, the importance of marriage, and say, okay, there's the concept of marriage is different. It's not a sacrament for Muslims. Um, but the notion that, um, for example, the sexual act is part of marriage, is a gift of marriage, especially, um, that's something that we can hold in common. Um, and so um, even on issues like human dignity, religious freedom, um, uh, the dignity of life. So there are a lot of cases where um, because of shared religious values, there's reason for um, sort of cultural solidarity. And I think thereby a signal can be made that the diversity of religions is not a formula for conflict, but is a formula for friendship. Thank you for that. And, and for answering all of those questions from me. I didn't get to the, the Eastern <laughs> right. I just, and that's I okay. that's dear to you. So um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I just apologize for that. I know we're sort of on time. It's time to get to some other questions. So. That's, that's fine. And maybe we can feed that into some of the other questions as, as they come up. Um, so very warm thanks to Gabriel for answering all of those questions there. And now it's time um, to turn to some of the questions that you have been sending in. And thank you so much to all of you who have done that. Uh, as we've mentioned, we'd like to invite each of you to use the chat function to submit a question you'd like to pose. And you will see now that the link for this form will come through. I think that's just landed. So in the meantime, I shall start with some of your questions that have already come in. So uh, the first question comes from Maine, and this touches on something that we've already discussed, but really looks at it from a different angle. So does Islam establish conversion of non-believers as an expectation of the practice of the faith? This is the, the question that we're, we're uh, having from Maine. Yeah, so first I just um, sort of announce again, although I already hinted at this, you think of me as a shameless uh, marketer. But, um, you know, in, in next week's session, we'll, we'll be joined by Naila Tabara, um, you know, a, a Muslim academic, and she's just a wonderful scholar and um, th thoughtful person and, and a believer. So um, it will be great, you know, to get her perspective. So um, friend from Maine and everyone else, make, be sure to come back next week. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the answer is, and um, I think, John, feel free to add your own perspective, but the answer is it depends on who you ask. Right. Um, and there, there are many Muslims who are dedicated to inviting non-Muslims to Islam. And if listeners, listeners haven't heard the word dawah yet, D-A-W-A-H, you will hear it soon. Because uh, Muslims are just as passionate at, um, for outreach or dawah which means invitation, as say evangelical Protestants might be to calling others to Christ, right? So um, for many, um, that, that is the goal, building up the Islamic community. This is God's will. God is pleased with those who carry out this da'wah. Um, I show my students sometimes videos of people on the streets. Off, they're often in the UK uh, doing da'wah in the street. I don't know, is, have you seen this maybe in London or elsewhere? John? Absolutely, yes. Um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, there's, there's a lot of da'wah happening on the streets of London, Oxford, also many other uh, British cities, absolutely. Yeah, and then at the same time, I, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I would say we, we have, need to be careful not to just assume that that is everyone's vibe, if I can borrow a word from my kids, right? Um, because just like there are many, many, many Catholics, almost all of them, who are not into evangelism. Um, there are many, many Muslims who are not into Dawa and they're just right. you know, live and let live. And, and talking of that, and talking, you know, talking of the, in a sense, the mood music um, that a particular Muslim or a particular Christian believer uh, has in their, in their dealings with, with the, other, the religious other. Um, we have a question here coming from my own country, coming from the United Kingdom uh, saying, did Pope Benedict's words at Regensburg have a useful outcome? And I, I like the way this question has, has phrased this. Uh, did, did it have a useful outcome? Uh, obviously, there's a great deal of controversy about what Benedict did or didn't mean. But, but yeah, how, how has that turned out? Great, yes. What a, what a terrific, terrific question. So uh, it's an allusion to a speech given in 2006, I believe, by Pope Benedict at his old university when he went back and 
you know, Benedict was just a great theologian and scholar, and um, he, he loved to enter into more academic uh, context. And he gave a talk in which he wanted to illustrate that basically faith and reason go together. Um, and he used uh, Islam as sort of a foil there. And he quoted from a debate, and it's not really the heart of his remarks at all, but he quoted from a debate um, in which the, um, the Byzantine emperor who had been taken prisoner of war, Emmanuel Paleologus, um, sort of challenges Muhammad in his use of the sword. And um, he sort of quickly moves on, but everyone's sort of focused on that, right? But the, the questioner is absolutely right. This provoked a series of responses, um, very um, warm responses, um, well, critical of that line, but warm in terms of their interest in dialogue. First, a letter by 38 Muslim scholars, and then a letter known as a common word by 138 Muslim scholars. And then some dialogue events followed that Benedict himself um, advanced, where there were meetings between Muslims and Catholics, uh, first in Rome and then in, in Amen. I, I believe that one of our great scholars at Notre Dame um, at the law school named Paolo Carozza was part of those dialogues. Um, I think he's associated with the Kellogg Center at Notre Dame as well. Um, so, and that project is still ongoing. There was a formal Christian response to the common word letter organized by some scholars um, from Yale University, but signed by many. And, you know, the work of the Pontifical Commission for Interreligious Dialogue um, has been very active with Islam and continues. Thank you for that. And uh, this is a question from slightly closer uh, to Notre Dame from Danville, Indiana. And this is a doctrinal question really uh, about the Catholic view of Muslims. And the questioner asks, does the Catholic church teach that Islamic believers can go to heaven? I think the right answer is yes. Uh, because you said can go to heaven, right? So right. yes. Um, um, my understanding of um, Catholic teaching generally on non-Christian um, uh, on the salvation of non-Christians is if we look at documents such as, as Lumen Gentium from the Second Vatican Council. Um, and um, even if I think we, we carefully read through some of the gospel passages where um, uh, Christ is, um, for example, praying for forgiveness for those who are crucifying him. Um, there, I think there are a number of reasons to, to see that the church is very hesitant to put any limits on divine mercy. Now, um, when we see a text such as Dominus Jesus, which I believe was published in 2000, does that sound right, John? I think that's right, yeah. Um, I believe was written by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, although it was still John Paul II, I think um, Ratzinger or soon to be Benedict was the principal author. That makes it clear that all who are saved are saved through Christ. So I think that would be the answer that yes, it is possible, but they would be saved through the, the grace offered by Christ um, through his you know, life, death and resurrection. And how does that relate to uh, the question of evangelization? Um, there's, there's, there's some tension of this when we talked about Dawah on the Muslim side. What about on the, on the Catholic side? How does this, you know, the, the Catholic church teaching that it's possible for Muslims to be saved, how does that relate to the, you know, the call the end of Matthew's gospel, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, how do these two things relate to one another? Well, I would say they, they both go together. And yeah, it, it's a false opposition to imagine that, say, dialogue and friendship are opposed to evangelization. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that's a false op uh, opposition is because um, evangelization, I mean, has been very clearly the church's teaching under at least the last three popes. Um, is about giving witness. It's not proselytism, right? So it's it's not um, constructing contrived arguments that somehow will manipulate someone emotionally, psychologically, or intellectually to right. convert. And back. that's how you're sorry to interrupt. That's how you're characterizing proselytism, that kind of manipulative approach, as opposed to evangelization. Don't... How how would you how would you distinct make that distinction? Yeah, evangelization would then be um, proclamation and witness. Right. Um, sh sharing of, you know, as um, as Peter says in, in his his letter, um, always have a reason, uh, always have answers for someone who asks you the reasons for the hope that is in your heart. So when you share that hope that's in your heart, um, I would say that's evangelization. And, you know, the church is not 
is, is not opposed to um, the baptism of um, believers coming from any background. So, um, you know, that, that can happen, but that's the work of, of the Holy Spirit, um, ultimately, and the, the role of believers, Catholic believers, at least as I understand it, hopefully I'm not teaching something heretical. Um, uh, if so, do not tell my boss in the theology department at Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> it's that giving, giving witness. That's great. Thank you. Um, one question that uh, question from uh, Whitestone, New York, apologies if I've mispronounced the, the place name, um, is this uh, very interesting, I think. Um, what are the differences between Shia and Sunni uh, Muslims as regards Muslim Christian relations? And how do the church's relationships with these two uh, or these many, in fact, uh, groups of Muslims differ? There's so much to say there. Yes, so, of course. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll just extend this by another hour or <laughs> a week. We'll, we'll get in trouble with Think ND. We'll never work with the world religions. World religions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe the best way to say, uh, to, to address that is first to say that, you know, there's a lot of diversity, as you signaled, within Shiism and within Sunni Islam. There are elements of Sunni Islam which are not interested in dialogue um, at all. And there are elements of Sunni Islam, which are universalist or perennialist, who completely embrace the validity and um, authenticity of Catholic and Christian belief generally. But I would say just, I don't know, just to give a nugget, instead of trying to give a comprehensive answer, there, there are in, intriguing connections um, between Shiite Islam and Catholicism, especially. And I'll just mention two. Um, one is in Shiite Islam, there is a veneration for um, certain leaders, we might as well call them saints, but properly called imams in the Shiite tradition, but also some of the women associated, for example, the sister of the third Imam Hussein, whose name was Zainab. So women as well, um, who gave, um, who either made great sacrifices or gave their lives for the faith. And, and that sort of witness in martyrdom um, is very important to Shiites. And there's interesting connections with Christian, especially Catholic practice around the saints. And then um, there's, there's, of course, a great uh, philosophical tradition in Protestant Christianity. So I don't want to downplay that. But um, a lot of the philosophical thought among Catholics is very interesting to, um, to Shiites. Um, so so-called scholastic thought associated with Thomas Aquinas. Right. Um, is, um, uh, which has some roots in Aristotle, of course. Um, it, this sort of philosophical thinking is, is really important in the formation of religious leaders, especially in Iran, but also in Najaf and Iraq and other places of the Shiite world. That's great. Um, I'm going to try and get two more questions in quite quickly, if that's all right, um, because there, there are so many great questions. And I'm, we're very grateful to um, everyone who's watching for all that you're sending in. Thank you from all around the world. A question from um, Sarawak in, in Malaysia. Uh, what's your opinion on Surah at Tawbah, Surah 9, verse 29? Now, I don't, off the top, I can't remember exactly what, which, is that part of the or uh, no, it's not, is it? Yeah, no, I can't remember exactly it, where. Yeah, I've got it, yeah. Okay, you've got it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah, it, it's basically a verse uh, which uh, commands the believers um, to fight the, uh, the, the, the people of the book, those who have been given the book, um, uh, so it says, So among those who have been given the book. Yeah, and then at the end it says, until they give a certain tax, named the jizya, and that they are in a, a sort of submissive state. So there's two sort of demands. We will fight you until then. So I, I, my own reading of this verse is that it reflects a certain element of the Quran, um, which could be, reflects certain circumstances at that time and place where there was conflict that had begun, as probably the questioner knows that surah, which is number nine, is seen as one of the last. So it right. could be when conflicts with Christians is really beginning. Um, and it has to be read together with other verses which suggest a more positive relationship between Christians and Muslims. Yes, that context and that, that conversation between, you know, within going on within the Quran. Uh, is, is something that you've mentioned a number of times. Um, I just want to draw in also a question relating to um, what Muslims and Christians have in common uh, regarding marriage. 
And this is this is pulling together questions from uh, several different uh, places, one from Milwaukee in Wisconsin, um, and also a question from Streeter, Illinois. Um, how does the Catholic Church um, understand uh, what's shared in the conception of marriage? And how do, does the Catholic Church understand what's what's not shared, perhaps in contexts such as the, um, the allowability of polygamy? So I, I would say that uh, at first glance, it seems like there's significant difference, right? Because, you know, traditionally Islam does, does allow for polygamy, for example, and also allows for repudiation, usually by the husband. At least according to legal schools, it's usually by the husband. He can divorce or repudiate his wife. It's much more difficult to do it the other way around. So those seem like, you know, whereas in the Catholic Church, you know, the model is the relationship between Christ and the church. Um, so it's this permanent bond between one man and one woman. So it, it seems that way. But I would say in the in the 21st century, especially um, when we actually look at, it, especially in the West, but also in the Islamic world, Muslim approaches to marriage, there's a great emphasis on um, its importance to the individual. There's a tradition where, where the prophet says marriage is half of your religion. And so it's it's part of your personal experience in life and almost a responsibility and then um, as far as on the broader scale, in terms of its effect on society, um, Muslim, Muslim thinkers generally, Muslim believers see marriage as essential for the, the thriving of society. So instead of thinking in broad units, in terms of um, the flourishing of um, a city or a country, um, Muslim thinkers generally begin at smaller units. So thinking of the, 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 the marriage um, uh, bond and then the, the family, the children that are produced there, um, that's, that's where um, lessons about religion and good character begin. And that ultimately leads to the flourishing of the entire society. Whereas we're seeing, as you know, um, challenges to this notion in the 21st century, um, Islam holds to it very strongly. Thank you, Gabriel. And thank you for, for the, all the questions that you've answered here. Um, just before we move on, I just want to highlight some of the topics that I didn't get to and to thank you for your questions on these topics and my apologies for not getting to them. Uh, some that have come in more recently on terrorism, uh, also on the question of uh, on the, the, the area of the growth of Islam among the African-American community within the USA. And also an, a, quite a number from the UK, actually, in particular, re, uh, regarding um, Muslim Christian relations and the Catholic Church's advocacy for the Palestinian people. So these are all issues that I didn't get to and didn't get to ask uh, Gabriel about. So I apologize for that. And if you want to bring them into your discussions in what follows uh, now, then uh, they, these are other issues that have been raised. So um, again, thank you so much to Gabriel uh, for all of that, um, and I will now um, uh, it's it's I will now hand back to Dan um, to introduce the community circles. Yes, uh, thank you, John, and thank you, Gabriel, as well for that enlightening and informative conversation. I know I was enriched by it, and I'm sure our audience was as well. We will now go into community circles or breakout rooms for 15 minutes. We invite you to introduce yourselves, share your location, and if you're comfortable your occupation and university affiliation. Once you've done that, please talk about the lecture. And if you would discuss the two questions that you see there on the screen. What did you find surprising or interesting about the relationship of the church and Islam through the centuries? And what lessons can be learned from the past of Muslim Christian relations? Once you've answered those questions, feel free to work together to come up with some additional questions that you'd like to discuss in next week meeting. We, of course, ask that everyone be civil with one another and be respectful of one each other's comments. Please note that if you choose not to participate in the breakout rooms or for any reason you choose to leave the breakout rooms, you may leave the meeting and join us again next week. Please note that we will always have one of our hosts in the main room here. So if you experience any disruptions in the breakout rooms, please come to the main room and let us know. As a reminder, for next week's meeting, please visit part three on Think and D, which now is available. Also, please feel free to share this series with your friends and family. We are accepting registrations throughout the entire program as each meeting can stand alone. Thank you again for joining us today and we will start in the community circle breakout rooms. For any who may be watching on YouTube, I don't think we have any, but just in case you are, you're welcome to enter the Zoom meeting now as we have plenty of room for you to be part of our breakout rooms. Once again, thank you to our 
fine panelists, and we look forward to discussing these things in breakout rooms and seeing you next week.